Hello, everyone, and welcome to the West Hollywood COVID-19 webinar series. We're just going to give everyone about two more minutes to log into the platform, and we will begin shortly. Okay, I think uh, we're ready to start. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Paulo Kesperdit with the City of West Hollywood and welcome to the West Hollywood COVID-19 webinar series. Today's topic is employer and employee resources. The City of West Hollywood has issued an emergency executive order aimed at assisting businesses and workers and has produced a toolkit for businesses affected by the coronavirus crisis. Information is available at the city's website by going to www.weho.org slash coronavirus where there are links to small business resources. And uh, for today's webinar, uh, we have uh, two guest speakers here with us. We have uh, Cindy and Ed, um, who are going to go over employer and employee resources. This is a jam-packed webinar, um, so we hope you all enjoy it. We also have uh, Tara, who's the city's business development uh, analyst, um, who is going to be available to answer any business-related questions as well. Um, but before we begin today, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to all who registered. Uh, additionally, the recording will be available at our city's website and on the city's uh, WeHo TV YouTube channel. Uh, please use the questions tab located on the right hand side to ask questions to our panelists. Um, and also the polls tab is located on the right hand side where you can answer our questions and see your results in real time. Um, without any further ado, um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Cindy, who will uh, start off the presentation. Yes, thank you so much. Um, my name is Cindy Flynn, and my firm is Hackler Flynn & Associates. We focus all on employment defense, protecting and defending business owners only. Paulo, I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yep, I can okay. definitely hear you. Um, and so, you know, I, I knew just very early on that I wanted to be an employment lawyer. I had parents who ran a business and I got to see what it was like firsthand to not only run a business, but to have employees. And over the years, my parents uh, came up against some very difficult employment issues. Ultimately, they ended in bankruptcy and divorce. But I knew early on that I wanted to be an employment lawyer protecting and defending business owners. And I think with COVID and what I'm seeing from an employment law stance is that we are going to have a rise in employment litigation cases over the next six to 12 months. And so our mission is to do everything we can to protect our business owners um, because after all, I mean, they're the backbone of our society. And so with that being said, um, because I am an attorney, I do have a disclaimer. 
Paulo, did my slides change? Slides change. Okay, perfect. My screen is frozen, so normally I don't stop to ask questions throughout. But because I am an attorney, I do have a disclaimer for you that content on this webinar should not be considered legal advice and is for informational purposes only. Communications made through this webinar and or participating in it do not create an attorney-client relationship, although we are, of course, happy to create one afterwards. Um, and then, of course, I have some links to third party resources and I'm not responsible for any content you see on there. Some of the topics for today's presentation, some updates on the PPP program, that's the Paycheck Protection Loan Program, um, an expansion on unemployment benefits, how to safely bring back your workforce and how to have your employees work remotely. Um, as the coronavirus outbreak continues to impact markets and industries in the United States and really around the world, businesses are confronting significant and unique challenges. Successful navigation of these challenges require thoughtful and comprehensive planning. The CARES Act amends numerous provisions of federal tax law that affects both businesses and individuals and you know i really wanted to focus today on the paycheck protection loan program and unemployment so when the cares act was originally signed into law in march it provided 2.2 trillion dollars in stimulus to individuals businesses and hospitals in response to the economic distress caused by this pandemic um, it has since been expanded oops sorry with additional funding um, and so what that looks like. So the Paycheck Protection Loan Program originally was funded with $350 billion. And then on April 24th, the government voted to fund an additional $310 billion in loans. So it covers the period from February 15th, 2020 through June 30th, 2020, and greatly expands SBA loan eligibility. I hope by now that everyone who wants to apply for this program has not only applied, but has also gotten the funding. Um, the loan program allows businesses suffering due to coronavirus, due to the coronavirus outbreak, to borrow money for a variety of qualified costs. Some new things I want to mention here is the fact that the SBA normally does about 62,000 applications a year. In the last eight weeks, they've done 5 million. So this is, this is a lot going on with the SBA right now. Um, make sure you are staying in contact with your banker and, um, and your CPA. Now, recently I've heard that there's been some talks about extending this from the original eight weeks to 12 weeks. So for an additional four weeks, um, that's just in discussion right now. I haven't seen anything passed yet. Um, and then also they are talking about um, what happens for those businesses such as restaurants that haven't been able to reopen yet. Um, and they are talking about expanding it from the date that the business is able to reopen for that eight week period. So I'll cover a little bit more of that. Um, so what's a qualified cost under the PPP program? Um, let me just make sure. You know what, my screen's frozen so I can't see any questions, but I'm always happy to answer questions. If for some reason I don't get my screen fixed, um, you can always email me and I, I love talking about this stuff. I, I'll answer your questions as best I can. So going into qualified costs, payroll costs. Um, payroll costs are defined as wages, commissions, salary, or similar compensation to an employee. This includes payment of a cash tip or equivalent, payment for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave. It also allows for a dismissal or separation agreement payment. Um, this includes payment for group health insurance benefits, including premiums, payment of any retirement benefits, payment of late state and local taxes. Um, and then it excludes any employee who's compensated more than $100,000 a year annually. Um, so what that cap looks like, it's about 13,000, I should know the number by now, but it's about $13,500 where each employee will be capped at. Um, and then it also includes, you know, mortgage interest obligations, rent utilities, 
and um, interest on debt incurred before February 15th. Um, and, and just an easy thing to remember is that the idea is that anything that's included on your employee's paycheck stub would be considered a qualified cost. Anything like your quarterly taxes that you pay the, the government, those would not be included. Um, eligibility. So you are eligible for a loan if you are a small business that employs 500 employees or fewer, or if your business is in an industry that has an employee based size standard through the SBA. Um, a, we've seen a couple businesses like Chick-fil-A, Ruth Chris, Shake Shack, the Lakers um, get funding and there was a provision or there is a provision in there that talks about a business that falls within a specific classification system. But um, we've seen a lot of those businesses have been giving back the money. Um, and, and so a couple other requirements, you know, you have to have been operational on February 15th of this year and have employees. Um, the loan is limited to either, you know, two and a half times your average monthly payroll cost or $10 million. And um, the amount is intended to cover in eight weeks of payroll expenses and any additional amounts for making payment obligations. Um, that time, this eight week period uh, may be applied to any time frame between February 15th and of 2020 and June 30th of 2020. Um, it's important to note, you know, that the interest rate may not exceed 1%. So if you've got the funding, um, at the very least, it's a great interest rate on a loan. Um, the maturity is two years. There's no prepayment penalties or fees and all payments are deferred for six months. However, you know, interest does continue to accrue. So forgiveness, what does that look like? We've been getting a lot of questions on forgiveness because, you know, your loan may be eligible for forgiveness on a tax-free basis. Um, an eligible borrower of a covered loan guaranteed under the SBA is eligible for forgiveness of the SBA loan in an amount um, that's equal to the following costs incurred and payments made during the covered period. And that includes your payroll costs, um, interest payments, uncovered mortgage payments, covered rent, covered utility payments. And that covered period means the eight week period beginning on when the SBA loan funded or the origination date. Um, and a couple common questions we're getting is whether or not you can prepay rent. The answer is no. Um, you can't prepay your rent. I mean, you can in the sense that you can always prepay your rent, but you won't get loan forgiveness if you decide to pay your rent for the rest of the year. Um, another common question we're getting is whether or not you can prepay your employees. Don't do that. Absolutely not. Do not prepay your employees for July and August um, in order to seek loan forgiveness. And just ensure you're keeping your CPA and your banker included on what you're doing. Um, the, the whole purpose of the Paycheck Protection Program is to help you retain your employees at their current base pay. So if you keep all of your employees, the entirety of the loan should be forgiven. If you, if you lay off employees, the forgiveness will be reduced by the percent decrease in the number of employees. If your total payroll expenses on workers making less than $100,000 annually decreases by more than 25%, loan forgiveness will be reduced by that same amount. If you've already laid off some of your employees, you can still have um, the loan forgiven if you rehire them by June 30th. And, um, you know, the whole purpose of this provision is to encourage employers to rehire any employees who have already been laid off due to the COVID-19 crisis. So any borrower that rehires workers previously laid off will not be penalized for having a reduced payroll at the beginning of the period. And then there's also updated guidance from the SBA where it was clarified that if an employee who has been furloughed or laid off is offered rehire and then declines, the employee may be omitted from the loan forgiveness reduction calculation.
Um, but it's really important to document anything along that line. You know, you have to make that good faith effort of wanting to bring that employee back, have a written offer, and, and then of course, if they choose to decline it, get that in writing as well. Um, common questions we've been getting, you know, is whether or not you can bonus your employees. Um, I have some interesting thoughts on this. You know, you, unless you bonus your employees in May and June for whatever reason um, regularly, I probably wouldn't recommend bonusing out your employees to get, to try to qualify for forgiveness under this. Um, I think it is something that you are probably not going to get forgiven if you do that. Um, if it's a bonus that's tied to something, like a, a non-discretionary bonus that you regularly pay out, then I think you have a good chance of getting that forgiven. But um, we've been talking a little bit about hazard pay with our clients and what that looks like. And, you know, typically we don't recommend hazard pay um, because in a pandemic, there's no specific cutoff period, right? It's not like, okay, June 1st, we're, the pandemic's over. Um, something with a disease could go on for weeks, months, years, just so much is unknown. And so if you offer your employees that hazard pay, you eventually have to take it away and there's no set you know, limit or time or, or when that's going to happen. And so instead of doing that, um, we have seen what may work and I don't want to, you know, hang my hat on this, but it depends how risky you want to be as a business owner is if you are open and you require your employees to be on the premises, um, you can give them a hazard bonus. Um, I don't know for sure if that's going to be forgiven, but it's basically something that, you know, says, hey, I know you're putting yourself out there by coming to work on the premises and here's a bonus for that. So just something to consider, um, you know, uh, keep in mind though that there's a chance that the law will continue, the, or the law will continue to evolve and, and they may make more determinations on what's allowed and what's not allowed and what's covered and what's not covered. So I would, I would not do anything like give your employees bonuses and pay um, that you wanted to do otherwise. Um, another thing that's a common question at this point is whether or not you can run payroll early. So right now it's the eight week period. And even though that may get extended from eight weeks to 12 weeks, um, at, at the end of it, if you're running up against that eight week period and you have three or four extra days, you can run an extra payroll. Um, you just wanna be sure that you're not paying your employees in advance. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I wish I could see your questions that are coming in because I always get a lot of questions on this, but um, I'll answer them if, if I get them afterwards. Um, so to seek forgiveness, a borrower must submit an application with documentation verifying the number of employees and, and pay rates. Um, you know, you want to keep track of any canceled checks showing mortgage, rent, utility payments. And then, of course, if you rehire by June 30th, 2020, you will not be penalized. An easy way to think about it is if you have an employee who is collecting unemployment as of June 30th, you want to look into it um, because chances are you will be penalized. OK, um, just real quick on expanded unemployment insurance benefits. The CARES Act temporarily expands unemployment insurance for workers in various ways, including amounts available to workers through state operated unemployment insurance programs. The law expands the scope of individuals who are eligible for unemployment benefits, including those who are furloughed or out of work as a direct result of COVID-19, those who are self-employed or gig workers, and those who have exhausted existing state and federal unemployment benefits. The only individuals that are expressly excluded from coverage are those that have the ability to work remotely with pay and those who are receiving paid sick leave or other paid benefits even if they otherwise satisfy their criteria uh, for unemployment under the new law. And so there's an increase in benefits. Um, qualifying recipients can receive on top of the amounts payable by the state's program, an additional $600 per week for up to four months, 
fully funded by the federal government. The extra funds may be paid as a separate check or together with the traditional unemployment check provided by the state. Additionally, recipients who were previously nearing the end of their unemployment can apply for an extension of 13 weeks with the state unemployment agency. And the total for California is 39 weeks, which is nine months, long enough to have a baby. Um, and so a question we're typically, you know, getting to walk clients through is what happens if, you know, you have employees who are actually making more money on unemployment and how we are, you know, really coaching and talking our clients through this is by letting your employees know that unemployment insurance is only for a short period of time, right? And they, they may need to have their employees go back on unemployment if things don't pick up or if another wave hits or if the stay at home order, you know, expands again. And so, um, you know, and if you say to an employee who's currently unemployed, you know, we want to bring you back, I mean, and they don't want to come back, then ultimately they will be denied unemployment benefits because you are giving them the opportunity for work and they are declining it. Um, so as we bring back the workforce, you know, for the businesses that have been able to remain open as, you know, as a critical sector or for when the stay at home order is lifted. And as we see, you know, different businesses are starting to be able to come back. OSHA has promulgated guidelines which identify employee risk categories to assist employers in, um, in determining what safety precautions are necessary, right? And so it's important to check OSHA regularly. They just issued this week an additional 37 pages of what to do in order to keep your employees safe. Um, one of the things that I'm happy to offer is a COVID-19 response plan. Um, you know, you need a response plan in place as you begin to reopen. Um, and I'm happy to send you ours. You can just email me for it. Um, my email address is on the bottom of every single slide, so you can't miss it there. We also have a, um, a playbook that we put together as well, and I'm happy to send that to anyone who wants it. It includes a welcome back letter that you can send to your employees, and it includes an addendum to your employee handbook. So you can take our addendum and just add it to your employee handbook. Um, and a lot of business owners have been finding that pretty helpful. So I'm happy to send that to anyone who emails me as well. Um, so bringing back the workforce, you know, OSHA has different categories. Healthcare workers and healthcare support staff are considered high risk categories. Employees with high frequency contact with the general public, such as school staff, those working in high volume retail, those working in high population density workplaces, those constitute the medium exposure risk group. And then employees um, with minimum occupational contact with the general public, such as office workers, remote workers, those are your low risk exposure group. So employee categories to assess risk and determine next steps. You know, those who are returning from affected areas, which we'll go over just briefly because let's face it, no one's really traveled. Um, those who are in close contact with those returning from the affected areas, those who've tested positive for COVID or showing signs or symptoms. And so when you have employees returning from affected areas, which is probably not very likely right now, you know, they're, they are required though to self quarantine for 14 days. They may be required to undergo mandatory health screenings by federal, state and local authorities. And then also uh, you wanna make sure you're following CDC guidance for release to return to work and maintain that high level of alert. Um, those in close contact with others returning from affected areas, they may be required to self quarantine. You want to follow CDC guidance for release um, to return to work for these employees and again maintain a high level of alert. For employees who tested positive, I mean, let's face it, with the ease of how um, transmissible this disease is, it's probably not a matter of if someone in your office or workspace tests positive, it's a matter of when. And so it's important to, that you have a plan in place. Um, you immediately want to send them home or have them remain at home. 
you immediately want to treat the affected area in which the employee worked as per CDC. You want to advise employees and or customers who were in contact with the affected employee and offer reimbursement for medical testing for these employees. It's really important, however, to not identify the employee by name. Obviously, if you're a small business, you have three or four employees um, and someone says someone's sick and that person's not there, it's going to be obvious, but that employee still has, um, you still have a duty to that employee not to disclose their name. Um, and also, you may have to give out workers' compensation paperwork, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, those who show signs or symptoms, you can send the employee home upon observation of symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Again, follow the CDC guidance, immediately treat the affected area, and you may advise employees and or customers who were in contact with the affected employee. Again, do not identify the employee by name, and you can emphasize, you know, there's been no diagnosis, but that you're acting in an abundance of caution. So in order to assess the risk, you may ask your employees to inform you if they have encountered someone diagnosed with COVID-19. You can ask them to inform you if they have symptoms of the virus or they themselves have been diagnosed with COVID um, or of any recent travel to highly affected areas. What you may not do is target individual employees with regard to these inquiries unless you have observed symptoms or have another objective basis for asking. How this comes into play, and I kid you not, I've had, I had so many clients do this in March where they were sending home their workforce of anyone over the age of 65. That is age discrimination. You cannot do that. You need an objective basis. I know you guys are out there. You care for your employees. You don't want them to get sick. Um, and so you send them home. You can't base it on age. Um, let me just throw that out there. Please do not do that. Um, and you also don't want to take this as an opportunity to ask about any underlying medical condition or disability information. Uh, so some safety precautions, follow CDC recommendations, ensure that all frequently touched surfaces are cleaned and disinfected throughout the day. This includes your tables, your doorknobs, your phones, your keyboards, your faucets and sinks. Um, Err on the side of precaution when assessing these risks. And, um, and now to talk about bringing back the workforce, on May 6th, uh, the governor, Gavin Newsom, issued an executive order creating a temporary workers' compensation presumption for employees diagnosed with COVID. Um, the presumption is retroactive to the date of the stay-at-home order and will stay in effect for 60 days. Therefore, the presumption is effective for employee employees working from March 19th through July 20th. Under this executive order, any COVID-19 related illness shall be presumed to arise out of and in the course of employment for purposes of awarding workers' compensation benefits if, and these criteria have to be met, that the employee tested positive or was diagnosed with COVID within 14 days after working um, the day on which the employee performed work at the employee's place of employment um, at the employer's discretion was on or after March 19th, that effective period. That the employee's place of employment was not the employee's home, so it doesn't include people working from home. And the diagnosis was done by a physician. Um, so this presumption covers any employees who must work outside of their home during the stay at home order at the employer's direction. So all essential workers who were required to cover, who were required to report to work are covered. The presumption also covers any non-essential workers who perform work at the employer's place of employment. Um, but this presumption is rebuttable. Ultimately, what you need to do is give it to your workers' comp carrier and let them fight it out. I know I'm running out of time here. So OSHA has a general duty clause. Um, you know, every business owner has to provide a place of employment that is free from recognized hazards that are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. Uh, a question we're getting often is, you know, whether or not you could have an employee who refuses to come to work. They can only refuse to come to work if they reasonably believe they are in imminent danger. And 
OSHA has a specific definition for imminent danger. And, um, you know, that includes any conditions or practices in any workspace that are that are dangerous and can reasonably be expected to cause death or serious physical harm immediately. So there's that. Um, and then work from home agreement. You know, as you transition a lot of your employees to work from home, it's really important to have a written agreement with them. You can say that this is temporary or only during the California stay at home order, but describing who is eligible to work from home and who is not as important. It's also important to ensure that the employee, the job responsibilities, the equipment needs, those are all met. It's important to lay out expectations such as start time and end time, being available and responsive throughout the day following company procedure. Um, you also, if you have employees working from home and they are hourly, it's really important to keep track of time worked. Um, at the very least, have an Excel spreadsheet and have them turn it into you once a week. You know, keep track of every break and every lunch because this is where business owners are going to be hit with an employment lawsuit in six to 12 months. I guarantee it. Um, an employee, we've already had employees say, oh, I just had one yesterday. The employee says, oh, I'm having to work through lunch to get back to emails and I'm not taking any breaks. Well, they are setting up the employer for a wage and hour lawsuit um, by working from home and not having an adequate time tracking system. So please, please do that. And please also reimburse your employees for expenses such as internet and cell phone. It does not matter that the employee already has internet at home. It does not matter that the employee already has a cell phone at home. You need to reimburse them. Case law says that just because an employee already has it doesn't mean the employer can have a windfall and pass operating costs and expenses onto its employee. So as an employment attorney, you know, no matter who you use, make sure you're checking in with them at least twice a year. Every January, California raises the minimum wage. Every July, there are like the city of L or county of LA raises minimum wage. So you want to make sure you're checking in with them at least a couple times per year and also having a handbook reviewed every year. Um, you want to make sure that whoever you're using has an experienced team of attorneys. All the attorneys who work for me have 10, well, really 12 to 20 years of experience, specifically in employment law. And then something we do is an early liability assessment, just so you know what's at stake if you have an employee who's raising red flags and making you a little cautious about working for you. Um, we have an employment compliance checklist. I'm happy to send it out to anyone who wants it. It basically lists 19 things that we think are the most important with employment law. And you can email me for that. Or you can text us, HFLaw to 66866 to have access to the checklist and receive up-to-date news on employment matters. Honestly, things are changing so fast. And when the Department of Labor sends out a new poster, I want to make sure all my clients have it and are up-to-date on it. I do not spam anyone. I, if it's not relevant, I won't send it out. Um, but our whole focus is really keeping our clients and our friends up to date on all employment matters. So I will try to figure out if I can log in um, while Ed starts his presentation to see if there are any questions in the queue. Um, somehow my screen is frozen. And then this is all of my contact information. We have an office in Pasadena. And you know if I am not able to answer questions, you can always email me and I'll see what I can do to answer everything. So with that being said, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Uh, Thanks, so Cindy. Um, so uh, yes, there are um, uh, quite a few questions that I've loaded up here in the chat and the questions tab. Um, you know, we could definitely facilitate those towards the end. Or if you want to refresh your page, um, you can type those in as um, Ed is talking. Um, but I wanted to um, also uh, bring up uh, Ed here uh, next up. I think you're still on mute, Ed. Let's see here. Hey there, how's it going? 
Good, good. Let me share my screen here. Uh, Ed's loading up his screen. Um, just uh, a reminder for everyone on uh, the webinar, um, please use the questions tab um, to ask questions of the panelists. Um, and also we have a poll up on the polls tab. Please um, answer that as well. Kind of gives us a good gauge on uh, who's joining us here today on the webinar. All right, Ed. Perfect. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, you know, City of West Hollywood. Definitely appreciate being a part of this. And, uh, you know, I know everyone just got a, a load of really amazing information. So I want to send a, you know, thank you to Cindy for being a part of this as well. Uh, and thank you for having me. You know, um, <clears throat> my name is Ed Legonde. I work with Nielsen Benefits Group. And our goal is to really help in employers enhance the employee experience and become ultimately an employer of choice. And there's so many different ways that we can do that. Recently, I was fortunate enough to be on a webinar with other benefit providers and advocates and advisors throughout the nation. And the topic was around um, culture and what it means to employers, how to engage employees, especially throughout these particular times, um, you know, as we're all going through the pandemic. And one of the things that we realized upon going through that was understanding what culture really means to people. You know, a lot of times there's this preconceived notion that culture has to do with the perks, right? The, the fun stuff about being at a physical office or a company, you know, some, some of the things that we maybe coin as the Google experience, like sleep pods or free meals or, or things of that nature that make it fun. And don't get me wrong, those are amazing. So if you're doing that, you know, definitely major kudos to you. Uh, but what we found to be a way to create employee retention and engagement uh, is to really help your employees understand your mission, understand your why, and to help create that employee experience. And I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to do is give a major shout out there because as we're all going through a very tough time, I've seen some very amazing and creative and innovative responses to how we're handling this pandemic. You know, and as an employer, you get to create that employee experience and everything that goes into that employee experience, everything that goes into that why of your organization, these are some of the topics and the things to think about, right? Engagement, are employees engaged and do they understand what they're selling at the end of the day? Uh, are we communicating and are we giving employees support and advocacy? Are we giving them lifestyle needs, supporting them as we know that we're going through uh, the pandemic, we also have very different generations in the workforce as well. So as we have a multi-generational workforce, everyone loves to learn things from a different perspective, but also have different needs. As we've been going throughout this pandemic, we've also learned that employees typically fall into three different camps, right? You've got the engaged population who are taking this as maybe an opportunity to embrace the challenge and, and say, hey, you know, how can I grow as an individual? How can I grow as a professional? And what can I do to better um, our clients or whatever it is type of business that you have? And then you also have the disengaged uh, population as well that maybe are just struggling, right? It's not necessarily that they're, they're not wanting to be part of your organization. It's just that they're struggling. They're not understanding how to handle um, you know, crazy times like this. And also, you know, even people like myself, right? When I come home and I've got uh, kids at home and, you know, we're not used to working at home all day, every day and, and dealing with children at the, at the same time, right? As they don't have school right now. So, and then you also have undecided where they can be teetered one way or the other. So I think as we really try to find ways to help engage employees, we just need to understand a little bit more about what kind of camp they fall into so we can understand the best way to support those employees. And while we talk about employees, we also talk about employers, right? The HR teams, executive teams, owners, things like that. And we see that there's basically two different types of camps, right? And, and no one way is necessarily better than another, uh, but we've seen two different ways that employers have responded to times of crisis, such as let's take this as an opportunity to teach employees about the benefits that maybe they didn't have. A lot of times you don't know what you don't know. So perhaps we can focus on all of these different benefits or offerings or support systems that we have in place and make sure that employees really understand and know that they're available. And then and again, at the end of the day, by taking some of those situations, you do help yourself become an employer of choice. Okay, so as I mentioned, we really want to understand or we, we strive to try to understand exactly how 
employees are dealing with this and what they're going through and what their lifestyle was like before and after, right? So these are just some types of questions that you can ask your employees or ask or put yourself in their shoes. For example, how do employees access their benefit offerings? Again, they don't know what they don't know. So can we make it easy for them to gain access to the types of benefits that you might be offering them? Or other benefits that are out there as well, other support systems. What's the most common way to communicate with employees? Is Was everything email-based? Was everything Now we're doing a lot of virtual meetings and, this, and things like that. So let's look at the different types of way that we're communicating and connecting with everyone. How do we best support employees and remain productive as well? And are there new in ideas or methods to implement? And we're all learning, we're learning from each other. I mean, you know, I give you guys a kudos again for even taking the time to be on this webinar because obviously you're looking for ways to learn and engage your team. One of the first things that we always recommend doing is taking that step back, take yourself from a 30,000 foot view and help reestablish your mission and values as an organization. Again, you know, going back to that topic of culture and what culture means, a lot of times what employees really want to be a part of is an organization that essentially has a great purpose, right? And they want to feel like they're part of that greater good, part of that purpose, helping further the, the, the organization along. So maybe it's holding the highest standards or moving the market, as you see here on the screen. You know, take, take those times if you can to spend um, those hours with employees to reestablish why they're part of your organization and why you hired them in the first place. So some additional ideas, what we did is we tried to break them down into different types of buckets, right? You've got enga engagement and communication, different types of support programs. And of course, one of the things we've learned is how virtual or technology can be uh, greatly available to us as well, right? So, you know, as the vice president of employee benefits um, and technology with Nielsen Benefits, a lot of times people ask me, what is your favorite form of technology? And uh, that's exactly what we're doing right now, you know, just doing virtual meetings like this. And a lot of times they can be face to face. Uh, for some reason, my camera decided not to work right before I jumped onto this, but uh, right before this, it was working. And these are exactly the types of ways that we're engaging with our team. My team, myself, we've been working remotely for a couple months now, but we're still doing our team meetings from a face to face perspective. I think that having that face to face interaction is a great way to build trust and, and build camaraderie with your team with uh, as an employer from an employee and employer perspective. Perhaps you can help your employees stick to a schedule. Again, we talked about those employees that are maybe engaged or, or in the middle, like undecided or disengaged. Perhaps you can help them stick to a schedule and at the same time, perhaps being a little bit more lenient in the different types of, of systems that they're dealing with at home. So that's definitely helped a, a lot of employees that we've been working with along the way. Build internal wellness and engagement teams. You might have employees that really want to have a voice and they do have a voice. And perhaps you can you know, spread your arms a little bit wider and then bring in employees in your organization that want to help step forward and and, and, and further mission and create more engagement with your employees or have employees step forward and share their stories. Perhaps they have concerns that they've dealt with and had some really creative or fun ideas that, that might benefit other people. They have employees step forward and share their stories. And we found that that's a great way that employees can connect with other employees as well. Another way we found um, that is a really effective way to communicate with employees is via text messaging. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we've been researching a lot for the last few years actually is how effective is email versus text message or you know in-person correspondence or things of that nature. And, you know, if anyone's anything like me, I happen to have an iPhone. And I, you know, really don't like seeing that little red number next to the text message box that lets me know how many um, open text messages I have, right? So there's this, there's something about a sense of urgency with text messages that allows us to want to get to that information quicker. And you're able to give it to employees in a more bite-sized way. And so from a statistical perspective, we've seen that text messages have a 98% open rate, whereas a mass email to everyone only has a 6% open rate. So we're, we're, we're able to gain a lot more exposure and engagement with employees just by changing the type of medium that we might be communicating. Okay. Um, another way that we found to be very, very effective, and, and especially through times like this, is to help your employees with a one-stop shop from a, a, a website perspective. You can create very cheaply, very, very affordably 
um, a one-stop shop for your employees and, and include anything employee benefits related or updates on um, COVID-19 or, or anything that you're trying to communicate from an employer perspective. It can be branded to your company so it looks and feels just like your brand so you can continue to brand internally as well as you do externally. But you again, you can post anything to these types of websites. Some people like to refer to it as an intranet. It could be a branded link for your organization as well. But again, we found that access to information has been key, especially when uh, we're dealing with times of crisis like this right now. There's other support programs out there for you too, right? So, you know, as, as Cindy mentioned, she's available, her and her team are available for you. Uh, if you need those types of legal advice and things of that nature, there's HR support out there. So definitely look on LinkedIn or Sherm or Pyra, tons of amazing HR support. So you can see exactly from an employer perspective, how to handle um, times like these, right? There's also employee assistance programs and behavioral health. One of the things that we've been dealing with and, and understanding from the employee concerns is dealing with behavioral health and understanding how employees can um, get support throughout these times. So if you have an employee assistance program, now is a wonderful time to promote those benefits. We've seen that over 78% of employers offer these types of benefits, but less than 10% of employees actually use it. And part of the reason for that is just because they don't know that it's available, right? So if you do have these types of plans available to you, or if you're interested in looking at those, obviously we'd be more than happy to share how you can get access to it, but it's great. It's like having a licensed master's level consultant available to your employees to talk about anything they need to talk about. There's family planning programs and support. Obviously, you know, as family planning is, is becoming more and more prevalent these days, you can bring in family planning support and um, from an employee assistance program perspective. You know, as we're talking locally to, to the city of West Hollywood, another thing I'd urge employers to do is look up local nonprofits and see how employees can look up local nonprofits as well, as well and support them. That's a wonderful way to give your community more and more feedback, more and more support again, as we're all going through this together, right? So some additional virtual resources uh, that we've seen get some really great feedback. We've had some employers who really wanted to establish wellness within their organization and things of that nature. So they were doing physical or in-person cooking demos or lunch and learns, meditation seminars, things of that nature. You can still do a lot of those in a medium like this. Right, where you can have a Zoom meeting or a Livestorm meeting or things of that nature and have a local chef or perhaps we can even give you ideas or, 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 or um, resources to do a cooking demo for employees, right? One of the things that we've learned is that with employees more and more at home, people are cooking more often. So we can actually share ideas and recipes and fun things like that, which again, helps create engagement. Again, meditation seminars and telemedicine as well. There's also brand new financial wellness resources. Uh, because of the CARES Act and COVID-19, in response to COVID-19, um, employers can now offer to, if it's affordable, can offer to pay, help employees pay down student loans up to a certain amount and actually save on taxes as well. So we can share some of those resources. So there's been some really, really great feedback in response to this um, resource. So we have ideas. So how do we get started? You know, a lot of times what, we, what we've done is realize that Let's not take a shot in the dark. Let's get to understand our employees. Let's understand the culture that we already have in place, what our goals are for that. Do our employees have access to technology? How often do we want to communicate? And what type of budget do we have in place, right? So these are definitely different types of ideas or mentalities to take as you're looking at bringing some of these different you know, thoughts and resources to your organization. So one of the re reasons that we love doing this is, is to survey your employees. We take a poll, right? Allow your employees to have a voice. And so these are just some sample questions here. And again, you don't have to worry about screenshotting this. We can send you a copy of this. We also have a full uh, list of questions that you can use as well. If you want to hear what are some of the concerns that your employees have. And by giving them a little bit of a voice, that also helps create engagement because then the employer can the employees feel as if their employer really does care about them at the end of the day. You know, questions like, what would support you in working from home? What would help you better connect with your team? Things of that nature. So by asking these questions, then we can truly understand what kind of resources or solutions we can bring in place to help alleviate those concerns of those employees. So here are just a quick, a couple quick examples of how you can get started with, you know, various topics. So again, as I mentioned, impl implementing virtual cooking demos, considering 
do all of your employees have access to technology or laptops? And again, if you're an essential business, you might be physically available um, or physically at work and things of that nature. So we definitely have to consider the type of business that you have and whether or not employees have read, ready access to technology. So there's tons and tons of different ways that you can do this. If this is something you find to be attractive or interesting, you can implement a subscription model with a well-known wellness company. Uh, there's wonderful companies, especially in your city and neighboring cities as well. That would be that would be a great resource to create a solution like this for you. One of the things that we love doing is finding local chefs in our neighborhood and asking them to construct a one or one time or multiple demo workshop. And it's wonderful because they get to share their name and also uh, put a little bit of a face to the name for, for local entities. Or one of the reasons why we love YouTube is the fact that you can just create your own kind of library to a degree, create a library for your employees so they can access it from an on-demand perspective. Another thing that we found to be very, very important in this time as we're trying to you know, give employees resources that are no contact, no physical contact, and, and making sure that we're at least doing our best to promote social distancing um, is telemedicine, right? So a lot of times you might have urgent care visits available on your health plan. If you, have, if you offer a health plan to your employees, then what tends to happen is there's a copay, right? Employees have to go physically to an office, wait for however long, and uh, just to get a referral to a, a pharmacy near them. So a lot of times or a lot of ways you can give your employees that that um, convenience for that matter is by promoting telemedicine. If you offer a health plan, most health plans these days offer a telemedicine at almost no copay or a very little copay. So you're saving yourself your employees money, uh, but also giving them the convenience as well. And then consider the budgets, right? So a lot of health plans do have these already built in uh, embedded te telemedicine solutions. But if you're looking for a very robust solutions, you can re reach out to us. We'd be happy to share some of the wonderful standalone solutions, you know, less than three or four dollars a month. And your employees have unlimited 365, 24 seven access to board certified doctors to go through any acute type healthcare situation. And if they ever needed a, a prescription for whatever situation, the app itself can actually send the prescription to a pharmacy near them. So that is my story, guys. Um, yeah, so again, just thank you so much. Here's some of our contact information if you're interested in, in some of the ideas that we shared today. And um, maybe there's other ideas that you have that you wanted to bounce off us. We'd be more than happy to discuss to see if it would help work for you. But again, just really happy to be a part of this. And thank you guys so much. Thanks so much, Ed and Andy. Um, before we conclude today's webinar, I know that there um, are a few questions here in the chat. Um, and since we're recording this webinar, I just wanted to go through some of those um, specific questions here. Um, so uh, question one is, is this webinar being recorded? Yes, this webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available on the city's website as well as our CCTV channels and also the city's YouTube account. So feel free to um, check out those for any of our past webinars, um, as well as this webinars. Um, there, there was a question here, um, and I, I, I think that was for um, Cindy, um, in regards uh, to childcare, um, and um, if those were covered um, through um, any legislation. I think you're on mute, Cindy. About that. Um, yeah, I answered it later down in the chat, um, but the FFCRA has an emergency paid sick leave provision and FMLA modification. Um, and there's a very narrow exception. You know, when it first came out, so many businesses were asking about the exemption, but this applies to any business, uh, any business at all. And uh, it's available to employees who've been employed for more than 30 days. It essentially allows an employee to care for a family member or child due to a school related closure. And um, it allows for two thirds of pay for that employee. And what's great about it actually, because a big question we were getting is, well, how am I gonna pay for this? Um, you know, if all my employees need to take emergency paid sick leave because of childcare closures or school closures, um, there is a 
a very quick tax credit that you can get. Um, I would definitely talk to your uh, payroll provider about this because you want to make sure that this tax credit is properly listed on the employee's paycheck stub, but it's a 100% tax payment for wages that are paid under the expanded FMLA or the emergency paid sick leave, and this goes against your quarterly payroll taxes. So a piece of good news. One piece of good news that I leave you with as an employment attorney. Yes, we love good news. We love good news. Um, and then I think another question that's probably good for um, everyone to hear also um, is, so if a restaurant um, or an establishment got um, a PPP, how long do they have until the, the establishment um, should be open from the PPP start date? Yes, so right now it's eight weeks from the date of funding. Um, but of course the government is realizing that this just does not make sense if it's a closed business that cannot reopen or is having trouble reopening. Um, so they're t in talks about changing the start date from the date the restaurant reopens or the business reopens, but nothing has been um, you know, put in place yet. So I leave you with that. <laughs> Perfect. I, I think I think that's a, a great answer there. Um, well, um, I think those are all um, the uh, questions that, that we had here in the uh, chats tab and the questions tab. But I really wanted to thank um, you and Ed uh, for all of your work in putting this together um, and um, helping our businesses. Oh, hi, Ed. How are you doing? <laughs> good. I'm glad it finally worked at the end. <laughs> good. Not a problem. Um, but I uh, wanted to thank um, both of you for uh, joining us um, on today's uh, webinar series. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the webinar is going to be recorded. Um, and please uh, continue to engage with the City of West Hollywood um, with our coronavirus updates, um, our social media information, and our websites on the screen um, and is available for anyone and everyone 24-7. Uh, so um, with that, thank you both again and uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone, Bye. thank you so much.